it going, my fellow members? And welcome back to Kira TV After Dark. Tonight's stories are from all over the place, and many you may find creepy or un unbelievable. I don't know about you, but these creep me out. So I'll let you decide after hearing them, so enjoy. Our first story is a classic called The Dover Demon. The last thing Bill Bartlett expected to see when driving with two friends through Dover, Massachusetts, around 2.30 p.m. or so on April 21st, 1977, was a creature. Driving along his car's headlights suddenly illuminated a particular entity picking its way along a stone wall at the side of the road. As can be seen from the picture that Bill later prepared, which is not reproduced here for obvious reasons. Copyright impeachment! The creature had a disappointing, uh, disproportionately large head, shaped like a watermelon, with two big protruding eyes that glowed orange, but it did not seem to have a mouth, nose, or ears. Its body was small, its neck and limbs were long and thin. Its fingers and toes are slender and supple. Such a strange word, supple. Never heard it before. The creature appeared to be hairless, but its peach-colored skin was rough in texture. It stood about one meter, three to four feet high, and was observed by only Bill. His two friends were not looking in the right direction to see it. Unknown to Bill, however, his strange sighting would soon be a substantiated by an entirely independent eyewitness. Less than two hours later, 15-year-old John Baxter was walking home li little more than a mile from the lo locality of Bill's encounter, and he saw a strange figure coming towards him, after receiving no reply, after calling after it. When he called out, he didn't reply back. John paused. And as he did so, the figure ran, figure ran away down a gully. John chased after it, standing upright on its hind legs and gripping the trunk of a tree. When he spied its brightly glowing eyes staring at him from an otherwise featureless face, however, John decided to let caution supersede curios curiosity, and he walked briskly back to the road. Once he reached home, he too made a visual record, a, a visual record, of what he had witnessed, and as can be seen, online, but not on here because of again copyright impeachment. His wholly independent illustration corresponds very closely indeed with Bill's. At around midnight on uh, April twenty second, what writer Lauren Coleman has subsequently called the Dover Demon was seen again, this time by fifty year old. Abby Brabram, Brabham, Brub, Brabham, there, Blaba, while being driven home by Will Tainter, Tanta, Tunter. I'll call him the Will the Painter. Eighteen. Who only spied it very briefly. Abby's description matched those of Bill and John, in a very apt respect and except want. When she observed it, its eyes were glowing green, not orange, and thus ended the curious case of the Dover Demon, for it has never been reported again and has never been satisfactorily identified. It could be an alien, folks. If the descriptions of it are accurate, and they are certainly very consistent, the Dover Demon does not resemble any species known to science, either from North America, Elsewhere, it may not, however, be entirely unknown. The Cree nation of eastern Canada speak of a mysterious race of pygmy entities called the Managishi, who delight in playing tricks upon travelers. According to the Cree, the Managishi have round heads, long thin legs, arms with six fingers on each hand, and they live between rocks in the rapids, excluding the finger count discrepancy. This description is reminiscent to the Dover Demon. 
Well, if you ask me, I think it's a freaking alien. Now comes a story that is interesting and weird as well as vague to your, so, to your tuned in ears. And it is called Goblin of Easton. It takes place in none other than Pennsylvania again. There was once a monk at the mission who loved money and power more than he loved God. He would hear the confession of a good folk who attended the mission and then would blackmail them into giving him gold and silver to keep their dark secrets. He turned many a wayward sinner's feet towards the fires of hell rather than get the gates of heaven, encouraging them crimes in secret while he re reveled them in public, reviled them in public, I'm sorry. It was often he beat, it was after he beat one poor old woman to death that the evil monk was imprisoned and sentenced to hang for his crimes. But just after he was cut down from the noose and pronounced dead, his corpse began to transform before the horrified eyes of the people. The face twisted, and small tusks sprang from either side of his nose. His, sh his shock of white hair grew long and greasy, and two pointed canines emerged from his slit of a mouth. The goblin monk opened his eyes that glowed yellow even in the light of noonday, and sprang to his feet that now ended in claws rather than toes. The people screamed and fled, and no prayer of his former brothers in faith could be banished the goblin. He disappeared deep into the forest only to return at night to prey upon the monks of the mission who he had been responsible for his death. After five of the brothers had fallen to the goblet, the rest of the monks abandoned the mission and moved to another part of the country. Since that time, the mission house has slowly fallen into ruin and decay over time, and the goblin has never been seen since. But some say he's rumored to still stalk the woods to this day. This next story is just for you folks who love to watch a, sh a sh TV show called Yukon Men. So you'll enjoy this and it's called Lost. This is a story of the Yukon. So you'll love it for sure. They say there one that there once was a prospector wandering through the Yukon with his two dogs searching for gold. One evening, as it, as it neared dusk, he found himself mired down in the muske, muskeg, 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 whatever it's called, rocky country with water just underneath the surface of the semi-frozen ground and just above the permafrost. It, is, it was a treacherous place, and would be very easy to sink beneath the surface and be engulfed. The mole prospector and his dogs tried to free themselves from its clutches. The mole lost they became. Finally, the prospector found a firm spot on a small hill. There were a few straggly trees on the elevation, and he made a small campfire and cooked up a bit of soup for himself and his canine companions. As the stars came out overhead, the man tried to find a comfortable place to sleep, knowing that in the morning he and his dogs would once again face the quagmire. At last, the prospector fell into a, an uneasy sleep. As he slept, he dreamed that a fierce native warrior was standing over him, threatening him with a spear. Why have you invaded the sacred ground? The warrior demanded. Leave it at once, or I will kill you. I am lost in the muskeg or muskeg or muskog. There, the prospector said in his dream. Show me the way out, and I will gladly leave. Warrior frowned down at him. I am the prospector of this place and cannot forsake it. But I will summon a guide for you. The warrior raised his arms toward the sky and called something in a tongue the prospector could not understand. Then he vanished. <laughs> the prospector was awakened by the sudden growling of his dog sitting up. He beheld the glowing figure of a beautiful Native American woman standing at the bottom of the hill. Blinked in, in amazement and amusement. No, no, amazement, I'm sorry. I have a little bit of a stutter tonight, folks. And felt chills run all over his body. The woman beckoned to him. And to his surprise, his dog ceased the growling. And ran up to her. 
They pranced around her like pups, and he felt his fear fade away. Packing up his gear, the prospector made his way down the dock into the hill lock to the treacherous muskeg 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 that surrounded it. The glowing woman smiled at him, transformed into a beautiful snow-white hair. The glowing hair hopped slowly ahead of the prospector, leading him all eastward. The prospector followed it, closely deviating neither left nor right from its path. The dogs followed him eagerly and showed no interest in chasing the hare, which is very surprising. For several hours, the prospector and his dogs followed the glowing animal to the treacherous twists turned of the quagmire. Just before dawn, they reached solid ground. The prospector looked around and knew where he was. At the head of him was the white the white hair became once more a beautiful glowing figure of a woman. Dogs danced up to her, and she patted them on the head. Then she offered the prospector a sweet smile and vanished as the first rays of the sun pierced the horizon. Now we come to our last tale of the night, folks. This you'll surely enjoy. It's called The Skeleton. It's a story of New Mexico, and you'll love it. There once was a boy that had been out looking for work all day with no luck. When night fell, he was far from home. He decided to spend the night in an empty, run-down house. The minute he lay down, he fell in, into a sound sleep. The boy was awakened quite suddenly by a thump on the roof. With a pounding in the heart, he sat up and lit a candle. A voice called out, I'm falling! The boy scrambled out of the way, just as a skeletal arm came crashing to the floor. The voice shouted again, I'm falling down! And another arm landed beside the first. Then a leg, then a chest, and a second leg. Before he could count to ten, a complete skeleton was standing in front of him, grinning madly. The boy lifted his chin and grinned back, determined not to show his fear. The skeleton was delighted by the boy's spirit and said, You have courage, son. Are you brave enough to wrestle me? The fuck? Let's see here. The boy was terrified. But he did not dare refuse this strange appar apparition. Skeleton and the boy wrestled back and forth, up and down the room. Remembering a trick his old brother had taught him, he twisted it suddenly and threw the skeleton onto the ground to thump. You've won, the skeleton said. Such courage is a reward. Come, I will give you my treasure. Oh, I don't trust him. The boy was startled. What kind of a treasure can an old skeleton have? Pick me up and carry me on your back to the next room, said the skeleton. Remember to take your candle. The boy pick, picked up the skeleton and put it on the, put on it on the skeleton. And, uh, let's see, where, where did I lose my place? Pick up the skeleton and carried the skeleton into the next room. As they passed through the doorway, the skeleton blew out the candle. That's not very nice. Let's see here. Okay. The boy picked up the skeleton again after, after dropping him startled in the dark, and he, and he relit the candle. He retrieved another candle from his back because he could lit, 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 light this one. Then he retrieved the candle from his corner of the room and carried the skeleton into the next room. As he passed through the doorway, the skeleton blew out the candle. Now stop that, he said, annoyed. The skeleton crack, cackled madly. The boy lit the candle again, and the skeleton blew it out. I'm going to drop you, the boy threatened. He lit the candle again, and again the skeleton blew it out. The boy dropped the skeleton onto the floor. I will break all of your bones, he said. Impressed, the skeleton said, You are so courage, courageous and strong. I will let you see my treasure. <laughs> the boy lit the candle and turned to look into the room. It was filled with piles and piles of gold and silver and jewels. I want you to promise me something, the skeleton said. The boy drew his gaze reluctantly from the magnificent treasure and looked at the skeleton. I want you to promise me that you will gather all the pe poor people you can find in one day and give each of, of them a bag of money. The rest you can have for yourself. It would be a good thing to share the, this wealth with the needy, the boy decided, so he agreed to do what the skeleton asked. The skeleton gave a happy laugh and began to disappear piece by piece, first uh, his head, then his leg, then his chest, then his other leg, and so on, until he was gone. The boy did just as he was promised. 
And when he had finished his task, he took the rest of the treasure back to, back to his family. They lived in comfort for all the remainders of their days. Well, that does it for tonight, my friends. Hoping you've enjoyed tonight's entertainment. I'd like to say, like a favorite, if you've enjoyed, subscribe and become a member tonight. Also, leave a comment and share if you wish. It always helps. I love all my members, and hopefully this channel will grow as time goes on. This is Kira here wishing you all a good night from Frights. Thanks for watching Kira TV. After dark, stay awesome.